Hey guys, my name is Taylor Hendrickson and I'm going to be talking about the Godfather offer and how to make your customers an offer they can't refuse uh, without slashing prices and going down the discount spiral of death that everyone seems to want to go down right now. I think this is probably the single most important unfair advantage that we have today in the world of business. It is immediate leverage you can apply to any business model, whether that be e-com, lead gen, services, agency stuff, doesn't really matter. All this really comes down to is you're asking your customers or your potential customers a question and you're asking them for something in exchange for something else. You're wanting to make that single question make it be as easy and fluid as possible. It usually adds zero cost to your business cost itself or your you know, product delivery delivery cost, whatever it is, um, and it makes price a second thought in their minds because all the price is is telling a story about that single value exchange saying, hey, if you give me this, I'll do this for you or whatever that may be. This also ex will hopefully move you away from being the discount whore that we're seeing today on Facebook and social media with everyone running flash sales and a limited inventory even though everyone's just drop shipping from AliExpress anyway. Uh, but first off, who am I? My name is Taylor Hendrickson. I've been in the game for about 11 years, working full-time online, um, big WordPress um, dev backend and shifted all the way to now we run about five or six different companies um, in the lead gen e-commerce space and we're kind of the bolt-on marketing engine for a number of other partnership businesses. Um, I think, you know, out of all the skills that we have, you know, me and my team drive a lot of traffic, um, both on Facebook and Google can build out full funnels, but I think the biggest thing that I can bring to the table right now is offer architecture and kind of the strategy behind it. So it's a piece of marketing that comes out and is that weird little intrinsic space that nobody really knows how to define very well. And most people think it's just making them a discount offer of 30% off, whatever it is, but we're not going to be talking about that today. So I run this companies full time. I um, also advise a couple of private equity firms um, in the multi hundreds of millions and billions of dollar uh, space, as well as a couple startup funds um, who are incubators or whatever. So I know a lot because I've seen a lot. Um, I certainly don't know everything, but I'm gonna show you um, in today what we're gonna be doing. So first off, what this is not is a bunch of tactic porn. Uh, this is one thing that obviously plagues the internet. The nice clickbaity headlines of a three-step formula um, to instantly double your odds on Facebook. You know, the old adage goes, teach a man to duplicate ad sets 10 to 15 times, lead for a day, but teach him to understand the algorithm and eat for a lifetime. I, I don't know, I just made that one up. But that's not really what this is gonna be, unfortunately. And this is also not gonna come from the IEM echo chamber. I think too often we just hear the same things, you see the same things um, within you know the Facebook groups and the offers that we see on native that we kind of get stuck as that's the paradigm. We can't really think outside of that. So what we're gonna be going in today is actual real life examples of what we're using in legitimate businesses as well as what large multi-hundred million dollar public companies and stuff are using and kind of everything across the board. So you can see the full spectrum before you go back back and apply it to your own stuff. What this really is going to be is how to think. And that's the most important thing I want to stress today is this is a framework or a five part toolbox for how to go through and stack an offer based on your specific situation. Not all of these are going to apply to every offer or every business, but is a way to, you know, use your toolbox that you can go out and attack things with and how to think about it before you go out and implement. Because again, you can just try to throw a discount at somebody and it's a tactic, but it's not necessarily the best one for every situation, especially if you're trying to go with more of a premium, you know, positioning and everything else. And we're also going to go behind the why behind those with 10 specific mechanisms. So again, the toolbox is more like a theoretical foundational pieces. The mechanisms are actually things you can implement today. Um, again, real life examples. And at the end, we're going to go over the 80-20 of all of this too. If you had to sum everything down to one specific piece, this is the ninja shit. So what is your offer starting off? There's a whole, here's the writer downer for the whole presentation. Your offer is not your product. Again, your offer is not your product you sell or how much it costs. That's the big thing most people think of. It's like my offer is just how much I'm going to offer my product for. That's not it. Your offer is the value exchange surrounding your product. That's the writer downer. Go write it, tweet it, whatever. I don't, I don't tweet, but that's something you can tweet. Or that's something to keep in mind and fully ingrained when you're thinking about an offer. What kind of value am I giving to my prospect, to my potential customer, in exchange for them paying money for it or committing to it or paying in other currencies in, in their attention and their money and their time um, and their investment, whatever that is in exchange for what I'm giving them. You can think about it like this. So we've all heard that marketing is basically, anything you're doing in sales is basically taking somebody from an undesirable before state to a desirable after state. 
your product or your offer is just the bridge in between those things. So they want to get from one place to another, whatever that may be. And luxury products, that's going from being less you know, important and distinguished over to more important distinguished. This could be solving a pain. This could be you know, solving a, I can't grow because of this. All this is is getting them from one state to another. It's not about you. It's not about your company. It's not about your product. It's what you can do for that customer. And unfortunately, because you know marketers you know ruin everything, there's sharks and shit underneath. Which is why only two percent or so of people actually convert to that final desirable state with your offer. So as marketers, as business owners, we need to deeply understand this specific piece of it. If we can't get them to where they want to go doesn't matter how cool your product is, it'll just be another neat product or gadget or gizmo that they're not gonna really want or is more of an impulse buy, which will get destroyed and, and you know, obviously in a down economy like this. So the first step that we're gonna go to, the first tool in your toolbox is, uh, or actually before we get there, sorry, jumped ahead of my slides, um, let's talk about discounting beforehand. Because again, everybody seems to go through this as their first hammer. They see it, it's like, okay, product not really selling well, slash the prices, fire sale, everybody may think it's a great deal because we have these images of Black Friday being these amazing deals. But what it really does is slashes your value perception of both your product and your company. Anytime you go from 100 to a 75 price, now everybody and their brother are conditioned to think, okay, if I can get it for 75, I'm gonna wait for it to come down to 75. And I'm guilty this too like even my favorite stuff you know bluff works pants i wait for their black friday sale to buy every single year um and so just i'll never buy retail because of that unless i really need to or really need to get something in so it trains you to focus on the price and not the actual value exchange of the product we all know those are your bad customers and we all know it's a race to the bottom and most importantly this really loses your credibility a lot of times because people smell your bs even through facebook and people are getting smarter i think you know we as marketers we really do a disservice to customers by not realizing they're actually fairly intelligent um, a lot of times they can smell bs from a mile away so when you go through this discount Counting, whoring yourself out to flash sales and whatever everything else you know people like to, to go to just realize you're eroding your company value and making people only think all right if you're slashing the price from 100 to 75 or 100 to 50 well now I think of your thing only as worth half as much because that's all I'm willing to pay for it now you're just anchored me at a higher price I'll never really pay the higher price anymore because you're anchored me at this lower one so this whole thing is not going to talk about any sorts of discounting. Yes, there are still applications where discounting really works, and I'm sure lots of people will stand by that tooth and nail to say you know, the sales work and everything else. Yes, they do work, but we're going to talk about ways to do it outside of that. So to go back to this, taking them from an undesirable before state to a desirable after state using your offer. The first way to do that is to make your path smoother and easier. Again, all we really need to do is help them along that path, starting off with. The first mechanism of doing that is through a process or pain reduction. So for the most part, there's a lot of these places where have, uh, or a lot of businesses and, and models and everything else have these like entrenched ways of doing things. And most of the time, that's the pain in the ass to do, honestly. It usually is in the benefit of the company. Like think of in intake forms on websites that are 10 or 15 questions long and require every single like title, job description, monthly income, things like that to process. Most most of the time that's for the customer or, or for the actual company itself and not the customer. So the questions you can think through in this whole mechanism is what makes people hate blank? Why do people hate my product? What could make this process easier? Even if it's something that's like, you know, hey, you sell products online to seniors, can you offer cash on delivery here in the US? Like instead of them having to use a credit card and trust you, like if that's a hurdle or an obstacle along your way, how can we make that process easier? So that's a whole thing involved in this offer. So for the people in the US, there's this big giant company called CarMax, and they are the biggest used car sales place in the world. It is a dealership across the United States. And they actually started from an old electronics store called Circuit City. And these guys, again, a big, you know, successful multinational company said, you know what would be a great business? We sell electronics, let's sell used cars. Yeah, nobody's doing that, clearly, and everybody loves the process. Um, but they went through and realized, hey, if we're going to sell used cars and beat everyone else on it, we can't just do the same thing. Because honestly, they're selling a commodity. They're selling the same damn used cars as everyone else. Same make, same model, not their product. They can't distinguish it in any other way besides the things they can offer the customer that no other used car lots can offer. So they went down and said, hey, we have 50,000 cars in inventory and we'll bring you yours. Most of the time, or again, one of the objections for people shopping for cars is if I go to the car lot, they're not going to have the one I want and the features they want. Um, so I might as well not go, I'll just shop online. 
This is saying that, no, hey, we, we'll bring the car to you for a very cheap fee. We'll credit it back to your car. We have dealerships all across. If we don't have it on local one, we'll ship it in to you. Oh, and also, you don't have to haggle anymore. You don't have to go through that song and dance between the sales guy and his sales manager about what kind of deal they can make you. No, there's no haggling, no pressure ever. And you also have seven days to change your mind and worry-free driving for 90 days or 4,000 miles cover all system failties, you know, failures and everything. So you just took the objections of, am I buying a lemon? What happens if I don't? Don't like it and have buyer's remorse immediately. Do I have to go through and negotiate and haggle with the customer, the you know, the sales guy, to do this? And what if my sale, you know car's not in stock? This took them from being able to say they sell about 2.3 times more cars than the nearest competitors, and these are the massive like dealerships all across the country. They sell a massive percent more cars than everybody else, and they make more profit on average than about $770 per car more profit on average selling a commodity for higher prices. Again, they're selling a commodity item for higher prices that nobody likes to do, but they're figuring out a way to be able to deliver great value through people through their offer, not even through their product or their pricing. So this is a great example of how to use a process of pain reduction to do so. Another, you know, obviously really common example is the taxi industry. It was a pain in the ass. Nobody knew the phone numbers to do. You couldn't hail them. If you're outside of a major city like New York, getting a taxi is a pain in the butt. So along comes a company called Uber. And, you know, while this is, yes, well, no, duh, they came up with a great idea, same with Airbnb. Um, What's the price of a taxi right now? If you think about that, it's like, I don't know. It could be half the cost of Uber right now, and I don't know. Uber can charge me twice as much because I know exactly what's going to happen. My process, my payment's secure. I know the driver coming to me is through this platform, and it's easy for me to do. So for that, just purely that like pain and process reduction, I'm going to pay more for an Uber, even though I don't even know the price of a, of a normal taxi cab nowadays. Um, same for the Warby Parker process too. So they took and realized, hey, if we're going to sell glasses directly online, one of the biggest questions is, what am I going to look like in this? Yeah, you could do the free like camera try on thing, but it's not really that good for the most part. So hey, instead of like you having to buy something and regret it and send it back or only have one choice, because most time in your store, you're sitting there trying on 100 frames before you choose the one you want, um, we'll send you five free ones to try on. And a bunch of other companies have now followed through with this. And that's the only place I buy my glasses nowadays because I don't want to go into a store, get hassled by a salesperson, or even just have to go to a store. You know, I like to work from home, so why not? Um, that's a great, again, process or pain reduction along the way. The second main piece that we're going to talk about, that main tool in your toolbox, is how to make the destination certain. You know, as you see right here, this in fuzzy destination is what most people or most marketers and products and businesses don't really nail down. Like, what is the after going to look like? What piece of your life is this product going to improve enough for you to actually trust me give me your money and I'll send it to you and you hoping that you're gonna get it so what we can really do is first off make that very clear here's exactly where this is gonna lead you to and if not we'll make sure that you, this is the process to get there so the first mechanism that is a meaningful guarantee and I'm not talking a 30-day money-back guarantee because that's like standard now. Anybody expects if they're not happy with their product, they can request a refund from customer service and they're going to get it. If not, they're going to go destroy you online. So if you're not offering that, that's just a standard now. But it does not actually make a meaningful guarantee. So the questions you think about in this mechanism is how can I put my money where my mouth is around this product, around the service? And how can I demonstrate so much certainty and confidence in this offer that they're just going to like bend over backwards and want to do it? So uh, for an example, one of the companies I worked with a couple of years in the past, they were a nursing education company. Um, and they were really against these billion dollar public companies. That was the standard in the industry. Nobody else offered any sort of training um, for nurses to get ready for this licensure exam called the NCLEX exam. And these are $500 products. They were not that well made. They were taught by professors, even promoted by professors in all these nursing schools. And they said, you know, hey, if you don't pass, sorry, you can, you can still use our materials. You know, we're not going to take those back from you, but we're not going to stand by any sort of guarantee or anything um, that you're going to pass this exam where, again, this is if somebody's been working for four years to and they have one final exam to say whether they can or can't um, be a nurse after this. And my, my wife's a nurse and she went through this and I saw the like the kind of anxiety going to, man, if I, what if I don't pass this test? So in coming into this other education company, we said, hey, we think our stuff is so good that if you don't pass the NCLEX your first try, if you go through all the material and you don't pass it, we're going to double your money back. 
And also, by the way, like instead of that five hundred dollar price, we'll do nine payments of forty nine dollars because we know your students. We know it's you know, money's not necessarily abundant. You just want to drop hundreds of dollars at once, and you can try it out for a couple days and see if you like it. If not, cancel. No worries. But that's how confident we know we are in our product that we're willing to open it up, offer you these things, and guarantee that you will pass the test if you go through these. What happens with five x revenue in a year? Triple digit growth since then, and it's just been on a rocket ship up since, and it's been on the Inc. 5000 list. So again, stand behind what you offer. We like to also send out some direct mail. I love handwritten direct mail. We bust out um, a couple hundred of these a day, um, looking to increase our capacity. And this is one of the letters we send out. Um, it's for a company called Fee Fighters. And basically, it's a company who goes through and negotiates your um, credit card processing rates for you. And we specifically target local businesses. And we'll say, hey, if I can't find you at least $1,000 in savings for your pest control company, then I will pay you $1,000 in cash. Simple as that. So anybody who gets this letter now suddenly realizes, oh crap, another credit card processing company. Now we stand by this and say, hey, we will stand by and pay you these things. That's how sure we are in the price that you are overpaying and we have a better deal for you. Great company called REI here in the United States and probably elsewhere. They are somehow able to sell recreational equipment, outdoor equipment, gear, coats, jackets, things like that at retail prices, which is obscene. You can get a button up shirt for well over a hundred dollars. Um, but how do they do that? Like how does it, like everybody else is going through this discount slashing, you know, Dick sports or REI or, um, big five type of models. Nobody wants to pay retail price for these products, but somehow, REI is thrashing everybody. They make $289 million. They've g they gave back. They donated to these charitable causes in 2018 with a 10.4% margin. Uh, that is what I estimate. Um, when compared to everyone else, 1.2% is about the average for the, um, the recreation industry like that. And they make two to eight times more per store than any competitors. So how do they do this? How do they sell the price for a lot more? They're selling the same things, not even their own brands for the most part, at a much higher prices, and they make much better margins all the way across the board. They do this because up, to, up to until about a year ago, they had an unlimited lifetime guarantee. If you didn't like your product, if it broke, if it wore out, anything like that, you come back and take it back to the store for exchange, store credit, whatever that may be. So people were literally using a tent for 20 years, coming back and bringing it back and trying to get a refund. They recently had to bring this down only a year's time. But it's a no questions asked. Like if something doesn't work out, if it breaks, if it's even just like questionable, no questions asked, they're just going to give it back to you. Another great example of this is a company called Shady Rays. I came across them when I was like just Googling online for um, prescription sunglasses. Um, and I saw this, I'm like, hey, if you lose or break your glasses, they're gonna replace them, guaranteed. Oh, that's pretty sweet. Even if I lost them, so it's kind of on the honor system. I remember talking to a couple other people about this, I'm like, what, that sounds really cool. They sell these sunglasses, which again, you know, everybody kind of knows how expensive sunglasses are if they shop on Amazon or if you source them from Alibaba, they're about two bucks, maybe three bucks for these polarized glasses. They're selling these puppies for $48 to $65. So they can go through and like, hey, you know, all you have to do is pay a small processing fee. But what this does is eliminate the surety of like, hey, what if I lose them? What if I break them? That's why most people don't buy expensive sunglasses because of those two reasons. It's not worth it to keep replacing them. These guys will do it automatically. And I guarantee you they're probably profitable on that um, exchange processing fee also. So the next part of this whole thing is how to make the destination more reachable. So again, most of the time when you're asking somebody to go from this undesirable before state to desirable after state, you have this big gap that needs to be jumped by them or needs to be like, you need to trust them to walk over your bridge on sharky waters. How can you make it so instead of like all that distance, you can say, no, we're just going to go a little bit. You know, we don't have to run 100 miles. We're just going to run this first mile first. And then after that, we can look at the next mile and the next mile, and next mile and after that. So one of the mechanisms we use for doing this is something called splinter offers. So you take your core product and be able to say, hey, here's everything we offer. We're going to slice off a tiny little part of that and offer that in the front end. It's not a discount. It's not like you're offering like, hey, introductory rate of this and then it jumps up to this. It's saying, hey, we think our like, whole product is amazing. We're gonna take this one piece of really high value um, that we can slice off, a small piece, and be able to offer it for an easy, low price or low, mostly a low friction offer. So most of the time, like your offer is big and it's kind of confusing of like, you know, we're gonna take this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna go through all these different steps. And it's a big chunk to swallow. Again, every time you, you know, um, the guy who wrote Story Brand, slipped my name right now, had a great analogy of anytime you're trying to get them to believe something about your product, your service, is like handing them an eight pound bowling ball. They can take one, they can maybe take two, but it's time they get to three, like their arms are full. So what this does is take and say, hey, now all that stuff aside, you know, yes, we can go and do all this stuff once we have trust later down the line, you know, we can look into that $25,000 service. But up until now, I'm just gonna take a little piece of what we do and offer that to you up front so you can test it out and see kind of what the working relationship, what it looks like and feels like. And hopefully in a very easier low friction offer with one tiny deliverable and one thing they have to believe.
So big company, again, in the U.S., called 1-800-GOT-JUNK started off. Um, and they basically had an offer. When everybody's switching over from those big old junky box TVs over to this new flat screen and plasma TVs, they basically made an offer and say, hey, we'll come take away that old obnoxious TV. We'll send two guys in a truck out. We'll take it away for like... 20 bucks, 25 bucks. I can't really find the price now because everything's been like mowed over, but that was a huge offer. And once they get there with a the truck and two guys and they show up and like, hey, you know, we'll haul this. You know, most time is that sitting out in people's garages. They haul it out of the garage and they'll say, hey, that looks like some junk over there too. You want us to haul that out? Well, sure, you guys are already here. You got the truck and everything. And they just started just like pointing. And you go back and look at the commercials. They relish the fact that all you had to do as a homeowner was point at what you want removed. And it was gone like that. Just like disappeared because these guys were here. So that helped them grow into a multi-hundred million dollar industry or a hundred million dollar company after that. With just a simple low barrier to entry offer with something that like, hey, I don't have to figure out, okay, these guys are coming. I need to get all my junk out to the garage. It's going to take like days of work to make sure everything's ready by the time they come because I want to pay for them to come twice, blah, blah, blah. Just made it to a simple no-brainer offer for them to say, yes, I want you to haul away my TV for 20 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever that was. Um, we are in the tax um, relief space also, and any sort of legal niche will know this also. Most of the offers that people throw out there, especially most pr uh, companies, are get a free consultation. Get a free consultation, free consultation, blah, blah, blah. This is about as appealing for most people as getting a tooth pulled at the dentist office. Why would I want to call in and get hassled by a lawyer who I know is going to try to pitch services to me when everything is just going to be a free consultation? We took that and said, hey, instead of that, instead of this huge, like, you know, we are, you know, when our fees run in the thousands of dollars, we're just going to take a splinter of that. We know, like, I've been talking through them. I know the process of, they took this initial offer of, like, hey, what's the first thing you guys do? Well, we make sure we get a collections hold in the IRS, file a power of attorney, do this, this, and this. Like, what if we could take that little front piece and just do it for a very specific price? You know, so we offered, hey, we'll stop the IRS and put a 60-day collections hold in your account for only 29 bucks. That'll stop the wage garnishment, stop the bank levies, and stop the IRS in their tracks for a full 60 days time. This is a lot of to scale a lot of the places where it's not just like directly query based and onto a lot of the social platforms um, to be able to off offer something that nobody else is able to offer. So the next mechanism as a little drug dealer piece. Just try a little bit, it'll get you hooked. And what this really does is it allows them to experience the joy of whatever product it is, or experience the actual, what it's like. And then you're able to say and take that away and say, what does it now feel like that you don't have that anymore? What is this product like and now, like you tasted it, now you really want some. So great example of this, whenever you sign up for a baby registry at Walmart, they send you this beautiful box of samples, free stuff. They're going to send you just for registering for their stuff. They send you this whole box supplied by all these different places because guess what? They want to get you hooked on Pampers. It's just a little bit of crack sprinkled on there because, yeah, you want to use Pampers brand, not Huggies brand, which, by the way, don't buy Pampers. Huggies is way better. But side side note, it's parent shit. Um, but this is a great example of how you can get somebody hooked on stuff right when they're first starting off. I remember we got a, like a, in the mail, we got a, a simple size of formula delivered as soon as we had our first child. It was incredible that like, wow, first off, creepy. But secondly, they're really trying to get you hooked on this one specific brand beforehand. They're spending, you know, multiple dollars per every single person to get this out there. Same with a beautiful place called Costco. Um, most people aren't going to um, recognize this if you're outside the United States, but this is Americana at its finest, as referenced by whatever dude that is in the back end, shopping, you know, in the background, shopping probably like 30 pound cuts of meat um, in, in the tip top shape of his life. But when you go through Costco on a weekend or most evenings and stuff, they have these beautiful people out there handing out free samples of everything. And it's great. You can get a full meal if you just go around the circles enough times. They can't say no. Um, but what this really does is a lot of times just introduces you to new products by being able to taste it. So how can you be able to take your e-com, your service, your agency, whatever that is, and say, hey, you want to try it out before you really want to buy. You want to experience this full thing um, before you actually want to buy. Usually it's a great way to do it if your products are of quality, obviously. Um, next thing we're going to go into, how can we take them again from undesirable before state to a desirable after state? So we made it, okay, we're going to make the process easier. We're going to make it a little bit easier to get there too. So it's going to be safer to get there. You're going to have these guardrails on you. We're going to be a good guarantee and everything. And also there's kind of baby steps to be able to get there. So you're not trying to bite off this huge jump before you can do it. But in the end, that desirable after state is the one thing that, again, marketers aren't necessarily really super defined about. So how can we make that more attractive? How can we say, hey, at the other end, there's not just another like place you got to go walk miles afterwards. There's a beach. You got to go hang out and have a great time at the end of it. So how can we offer something that really makes them want to? Now I'm much more motivated to get to the other place. You know, if you're trying to give away a, a free weekend getaway to Des Moines, Iowa, you're gonna have a lot fewer people jumping through that versus you know an all expenses paid trip, all expenses paid trip to Hawaii. People are gonna do a lot more for that attractive in state, even if the path there is a lot harder, a lot more expensive. 
So the fifth mechanism on the way, almost halfway there, is give them the thing they actually want. It's a no-brainer. It's kind of baffling. But most of the time as marketers, as, as business owners, um, we're selling broccoli. We're selling preventative things. We're selling process. We're selling work. A book is work. A course is work. All these things, even though they're aspirational and they're kind of like scratch an itch temporarily of anxiety, they don't actually want those things that you're giving away. So, you know, Perry Belcher talks about this as a premium. There's a lot of other places to use this um, to be able to try to get people on board for selling whatever thing you they want to buy. So what is the thing that would make your audience say, whoa, that's freaking awesome. You know, how can I get that? Um, what's the hole that they're actually looking for? If you're selling drills, well, you're not actually selling drills. You're selling holes, drilled in whatever thing they want to drill a hole into. So what is that thing you can offer them that's actually something they really want to think about and hold? And how can I make it all about them too? Again, it's not about us. It's not about anything we can do. Our product is just a bridge to get them from point A to point B and have that B being a desirable after state. So NRA does this well. A little West Coast, gun tone American, yeehaw. Um, NRA is basically saying, hey, you know, a membership to the NRA, that doesn't really deliver any value besides you can now put an NRA sticker on your car, but if that's really a motivator to you, you're probably already a member of the NRA. But they said, hey, you know, as your free welcome gift, again, this is their whole landing page you come to, and then you scroll down and actually sign up. We'll give you all these, you know, you can choose between a knife or a duffel bag or a hat, a bunch of different stuff you can do. It's the thing they actually want. Say, oh, wow, that's a, that's a pretty cool looking knife. Yeah, sure, I'll do, I'll do that. And like the membership is very much an afterthought. Um, the Sports Illustrated football phone is another great example of this too. Um, here's another one from um, Survival Life. They say, hey, your order's not complete. Do you want the number one tactical pen? You can add your order. Wait, you know, it's a one-click upsell. You get this $119 tactical pen along with it. I've seen knives in here. I've seen a bunch of other things in when you join this membership. No obligation, 17 a month type membership. So force continuity, a little bit shaky, whatever it is, but this is the thing they actually want. They don't want to buy work. They don't want to buy another membership. Um, same, going back to the tax relief space, most of the time it's, hey, give us your information and we'll probably hound you. We might sell your information to four different companies and then you're gonna get called repeatedly until the day you die, you're gonna hate our industry. Um, instead, we said, hey, instead of that, we wanna offer an idea of your personal situation. How can we make it about them? We say, hey, we'll take, based on all of our data in the back end, we'll give you an estimate of how much you can save, which IRS programs you may qualify for, and then what you should do next afterwards. It takes about 59 seconds, and we'll ask a series of questions to kind of know where you stand. This is an amazing tool. It makes it so people actually want to fill out an online form instead of just like, if I fill this out, I know I'm just gonna get hounded, and everybody's kind of getting to that point also. Um, another digital product company um, that we've worked on in the past, again, well, Depends on the, the relationship space, not necessarily the, the most industry you want to go tell your mom about or your grandma about, but hey, ball, you know, company is making a bunch of money doing it. So we took this idea of, hey, instead of this like, you know, five tips, ebook, whatever it is, um, we said, hey, what are the chances of actually getting your ex-boyfriend back? And this is the burning question that every like teenage girl coming to this site who had deep anxiety about her ability to get their ex-boyfriend back was, you know, their mind was racing on. It's like, can I get him back? What's the chances? All this stuff. So we put out like a 30 question quiz and it crushed it. Front end conversion rate was insane. We used it for front end paid traffic and everything else. It was the perfect segue to either both pre-frame the questions that we were getting to or the solution that we were getting to, as well as give them some specific information on kind of a weighted system of like, all right, based on everything we've seen on your age and their age and have the situation and everything else, here's what your chances are looking like. So it's a great offer to give them personalized information on that. Next mechanism for making the destination more attractive is how can you use high-end or exclusive offers to do this? And what this actually really comes back to, any sort of luxury product or high-end product that people are trying to pitch, um, all it really is saying is how, what does this say about them as a customer? They have high taste, they're able to afford it, they're successful, they're doing well, they're valuable is what they're really looking for. So how can you sell jealousy and whatever it is? Or how can you sell the fear of missing out? You know, it's kind of different mechanisms for every person based on what they're really motivated by. But for most high-end stuff, this is a great way to think about it. You know, obviously if you have a name like Gucci, you can sell a swimsuit that you can't even swim in for $380. And guess what? It's sold out online. You can't see it behind my arrows because my face is in front of it, but it sold a $380 swimsuit online for, that you can't even swim into. Supreme made a brick. They're selling bricks and garbage cans and just random stuff. And I think for the most part, they're just trying to figure out what people won't buy that they slap their name onto, which is kind of a silly, sad look at, at what people are, are going to, but they're able to throw $380 at a single piece of fashion wear. What does that say about them? How can you make it exclusive? So obviously Gucci is exclusive. 
at least it used to be. What other ways can you make it so this is a limited edition thing, this is a limited release thing, or I'm special. You should be jealous of how special I am. There's about 2,238 barbecue restaurants in Texas as of about 2015, 2016. That's the last number I could find. But why is this place, kind of a dingy looking place, um, in the middle of Austin named Franklin's, um, why does this make people line up around the block for anywhere between two and four hours before they open? They open up at about like 11 a.m. every day. And before then, if you're not in line by like eight or nine, you might not get barbecue. They only make a certain amount. They make, you know, thousands of pounds a day. But people line up for the experience of this. Well, at the same time, it's probably, you know, they, they tell you the recipe. There's nothing special about it. Salt, pepper, and smoke. That's it. Same with everybody else in Central Texas. It's the same thing. And if you set their barbecue side by side, you probably wouldn't even tell the difference. But because this is now limited and exclusive, this is where people are actually hugely motivated to take action and stand in line and pay a huge price in time. Or think about like our attention spans are in the seconds. They were willing to stand in line for hours to say they went to Franklin's, to have a selfie at Franklin's, take a picture of them eating at Franklin's. It's a good idea of like, you know, once you get a little bit of a name of like, hey, that restaurant has lines out the door, you're you know, never going to be able to get in. Oh, I need to go there. It's exclusive. I can get in. I can say that. How's the food? It doesn't matter. It's got lines out the door. <clears throat> so, mechanism number seven, rocking through these. Um, next one's a crazy no-brainer. And this is kind of a form of a discount, but in the sense of this is something that is so kind of preposterous and out there, we want to figure out how can we make them feel stupid for not buying it. There's a famous example here that a lot of marketers are pointing to, but it's a famous Columbia Records example. And they say, would you like to have 13 records of tapes for only a dollar? They're running some records and tapes and CDs. And in this time, they started making, I think it was about 15 to 20% of all the music sold worldwide through this offer. They blanketed magazines and TV ads for it. And everybody got in and hook, got hooked. And this is the this is the grandfather of, you know, Rebuild Nutra or Force Continuity Nutra of saying, hey, once you get in, like you jo agree to join the records club at $17 a month and we'll send you your latest record all the time. So even though they had this introductory offer where they were losing money on the front end acquisition of people, it was such a no brainer compulsion offer. And back in the day, it's really hard to cancel. Um, they got a tremendous amount of people coming in by just like, oh my gosh, they saw that. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what everything else that was on there. They're going to send you this stuff. And they got to be a massive multi-billion dollar company because of that, doing billions of revenue a year. We do this in another business that we have, a specifically a tax um, prep and tax um, uh, consultancy for firefighters saying, you know, you know, obviously we have the offer too, the, the big guarantee. If we can't find you $200 in savings, I'll pay you 200 bucks in cash. But our main no brainer offer in this thing, well, first was that like, you're going to have, you're going to get 200 bucks at least no matter what, we're going to show you where that money is sitting, hiding from you. Um, I don't know where the rest I was going with that, but that's one of the other first two. It's like, hey, if we can't find these $200 in, sa in, in savings, we'll pay you $200 in cash. So anybody who comes to this and sees it will just be a no-brainer where they're like, okay, that's, there's no reason they would not act. So next mechanism we're going to talk through is called bundling. So bundling is how to go through, and you th way to think through it is how can you sell certainty or the complete package in your offer? Or how can you make them a hero in whatever is they're going to be by including more quantity with it? So obviously bundling is a big and nice thing to do. Most um, e-com retailers, um, if they have kind of the hybrid version where they send you a sales page, will have the one, buy two, get one free type of offers. But there's other ways of adding to this so it now has a better offer than, rather than just well, like higher quantity discounts. We're still a great tool. We use those all the time. But how can you sell certainty or the complete package? Package, especially when you can compile with things that you know they necessarily need. Prime example of this is bag salad. Anytime you go to the grocery store, you see these little puppies, and it probably costs about a dollar for the lettuce if you bought it retail, another 20 cents for the Caesar dressing, another 10 cents for the croutons and cheese, whatever it is. Somehow they sell the thing for five dollars, which is like a 3.5 times um, markup for the same freaking stuff in the middle. But because you now have to say, okay, now I have everything I need, and one, I'm willing to pay a premium for that thing. You think of the same thing with you know a component type pieces. You can go buy a single component, or here's the entire package. Everything you need is right here. You don't have to worry about anything. And most of the time, it removes that uncertainty and anxiety. Do I have everything I need? Do I have, every, you know, what pieces are included? Nope. There's everything you need for that certain thing. Great. You're selling certainty besides the value of your product, and you can oftentimes charge a lot more to do so. Another example for this is the masterclass. It said buy one and give one on us. So now the main cost of that membership is kind of negated. We ended up buying this on this offer too. It was great. We gave it to my in-laws as like, some, hey, this is something you would really be interested in. So you made them the hero. You made them suddenly look really good in the, in the eyes of somebody else. 
just by being able to give them something for free um, to include with it. We often do this with physical products too. It's like, hey, buy one, and then we're also going to include one for you to give to a friend to help them out, and you, they can solve the same problem you're trying to solve. So now it's like, okay, if I buy this, my, my destination that I'm trying to get to is now so much more attractive, because not only do I get this problem solved, I get to be the hero. I get to be looked at as something that's really valuable, trying to recommend something great to my friends, or I can give them something for free, I can give a gift. Now, they could have even increased the price on this. I don't know the price of this before. They could have just doubled the price and say, now it's just a buy two offer instead of just a buy one offer. But now you're able to, like, that one person's willing to buy one. And most of the time, I'm willing to, here's an interesting kind of anecdote on this also. I'm willing to spend a lot more on something if it's for somebody else than I am for myself. And a lot of people have that because not only does it, like, now, you know, great examples like the food delivery stuff. I'm kind of a cheap ass. So anytime I get the food delivery, like looking at it, I'm kind of doing the math and the pricing. Like, hey, what is this compared to me going to the grocery store and first compiling myself? So I have a limited price I would necessarily pay for that. But for my grandma, if I were buying the same thing for my grandma to make sure she has adequate nutrition during the day, it doesn't go hungry, it doesn't like go malnourished, I'd pay a lot more. The price becomes much less of a big deal because it's for somebody else. So you're giving a lot more than just your end product delivery. You're giving them the ability to be good to somebody else. So the last and final thing is how can you make the destination mean something? Yes, you can make it attractive, but oftentimes that's kind of the first level um, desire or need for somebody. Like, oh, that seems nicer than it was before. Obviously, it's got palm trees and stuff. Um, but you know, a trip to the beach is great. It can be really fun. It's nice to sit and relax. But what is that worth? It's actually the great memories of you and your family going to the beach. As a father, having kids now, it's like I really relish and look forward to those times, those memories you can make looking forward to going to the beach, having fun playing in the sand, being able to see, like, catch a crab and watch my son go nuts over it and talk about it for years and all those different things. Like my parents still tell stories of all these vacations where they did that. So the vacation itself then becomes kind of an afterthought. The price itself is not, then becomes an afterthought. How can we make that thing we're selling or the reason for somebody to go across this bridge over shark infested waters mean something more? Be not only attractive, but mean something a lot more than it does before. So the first way we do this is through a, mech, a mechanism so I'd like to spit is what is it worth to you? What's it worth to you? And the question you can say is like, how can we make them put a price on the pain? of not doing it? What's the cost of necessarily they're in or the cost they're already doing it? And what's also the price on joy? How can you give them the joy? Or what, is, what is that joy worth to them in the end? One thing we have is some home security products. So how much is stopping a home invasion worth to you? Sure, you can put statistics in the average Average burglary costs all this, but what's the cost of the emotional trauma? What's the cost of the ongoing fear and anxiety for your family? Or God forbid there's an assault or violence on somebody. What's that going to cost? Now you can solve it for the simple product that costs less than a fast food meal. So suddenly you just took the price and made it irrelevant because they're price anchoring off of not only thousands, but also all of these really tough emotional pieces that can carry with somebody for a long time. That, that scary little boy showing the prime example of it. You can also shift this around to the joy side. How can you give the joy and the confidence of a home run? So this is a, bad, a hitting education company. They sell a membership. They don't sell any physical products or anything, but it's one of the best hitting instructors in the game. And what he does is not only just give them more power, because hitting the ball further, what does it actually even mean? You hit the ball a little bit further. You won a game where you ran around a base and hit a ball around people. It's just a game, and it's going to be forgotten afterwards. But what this really does is give joy and confidence to that young hitter, which will carry through the rest of their life. You'll have more success, build more fun, hit more consistently, and that'll carry through that confidence to be, they, them being able to say they can do anything in the future. And by the way, something a $400 bat can't buy. So we're initially price anchoring high. If you're already trying to buy things and do things with that, you know, your alternative is you can buy a $400 fancy you know, new technology bat. That's not going to fix a $4 swing. That's one of the lines we use too. It's great. So next one is going to be able to use price anchoring. And there's ways of doing that too, where you're able to say, not necessarily just like, here's where our competitors are and anchor it down, but most of the time it's like, what are they already spending on? Where are they, how can we, or what are the price of those alternatives that they're already doing? So either what are they spending on already around this subject to make it look small in comparison? What's the price of some of the alternatives they're doing to get, try to get to the same destination? You know, if they're already crossing this other bridge, it's way more expensive. How can we position our product as a lot more of like, hey, you're already doing this other alternative, it's a lot more expensive. Um, or what is the cost of failure? 
look like again if you don't do this what's the what's the risk what's everything involved you know if, if in the star wars um saga if there wasn't an actual like evil death empire you know the empire and darth vader going through that could you know the risk of them not destroying the death star was the whole galaxy is going to be taken over if that wasn't there and it was just like luke running around with yoda it wouldn't be a very interesting movie so what are the stakes and this is really setting the stakes of kind of what they're up against for doing or not doing whatever that thing is so price anchoring can be held in a couple different fashions going back to the baseball example and the hitting coach um is you know you already are spending about thirty seven hundred dollars per year on travel baseball stuff between all, everything else that's on average all the way up to eight thousand and but how much is that game winning, winning hit worth would you pay the whole season for just one of those hits? The look of joy and elation on that kid's face when he comes back and has done that thing. You already spent four hundred dollars on a new bat, but it can't fix your four dollar swing. Our lowest price is seventy four bucks. You can get started for a dollar today. So we're walking all the way down to like, first off, what's that worth? What would I pay for it? Thinking of like, oh, we're putting a pain or price on the joy, but now bringing it back to here's what it actually costs. It's a fraction of that. In the tax prep company, again, for firefighters, for ladder tax, we try to figure out, first off, most people use TurboTax. Most people use this free guaranteed $0, $0 file. It's pretty damn hard to compete with free and try to make any money at it. In fact, it's you know almost impossible sometimes. Um, or even H&R Block, who charges you know 60 bucks or 70 bucks for the file of their taxes. But the way we position it is realizing, okay, you can go to these places and file for free, but it's going to cost you a lot more, actually, because they're only just going to file your paperwork. They're not going to ha- help you actually plan for your taxes or help you save on taxes right away. Most of the time, they're just going to be this like one-size-fits-all system. And by the end of it, it was free, but you paid $500 extra in taxes than you should have. So how free is that? So we're able to say, hey, even though like now our price doesn't necessarily matter, as long as your savings are going to be much higher than that. Most of the time we have ways of saving people anywhere from three to 5000 on their taxes. So what are they willing to pay for our services? Well, a lot more because guess what? The net, we can compete against free and be cheaper than free, which is a great way to do it. And to jump in on a couple e-com products, we'll talk about this just because, you know, I haven't really touched on some of the e-com stuff very much. Um, so we'll take a couple of the Giddy Up products and go through these and how you can price anchor these things to specific, you know, here's some angles we would work at or how we can, you know, position these in the front end. So fixed is this like, you know, mechanic, um, it's your car diagnostic tools. You plug it in your car, you figure out exactly um, what is wrong with your car. So it's like, hey, you know, you can avoid losing thousands to dishonest mechanics for only 49 bucks. Very simple. Everybody's kind of gone through that pain of not being duped, especially. So not being duped, not losing money. There's a couple anchors you can price on it. Say, hey, what is what is being duped by a mechanic? What is that worth to you? What is it worth paying not to have that happen? For the visor, it's their heads-up display, you just like they put on your dashboard and it reflects up there. Um, so you can see without having to look down at your phone, your navigation. You know, what is it worth to prevent the pain of a $25,000 car accident for only 50 bucks? Or you can prevent the pain. So first off, pain, you just price anchored at what's their pain worth, but also 25000 is what the cost of the average car accident is. That's with no medical like bills or anything like that. That's just purely damage to cars and investigation, insurance costs, things like that. <coughs> for the dot owl, whatever, whatever, however you say it, you know, for the sleep thing, basically just a, a thing that has lights and sounds and stuff on your bedside, you will get better sleep than with your $4,000 mattress. Because, like, again, what are the alternatives people are already paying for? Is the $4,000 Tempur-Pedic mattress? If they're even considering that. If well, Their whole question is, I could pay 1000 bucks for a normal mattress or 4000 for this Tempur-Pedic one. Well, is the Tempur-Pedic one worth it? Am I going to get better sleep? Am I going to be more comfortable? Um, and also, this will help you to extra performance at work. Well-rested, you're going to perform a lot better. You can make a lot more money. So with a simple $50 tool, whatever it is, this is how you can get this price anchor against those other much higher alternatives of both you know, cost of pain, you know, it's going to pain you to pay $4,000, but you'll get this potential much bigger improvement at work. And lastly, this cool thing called the neck hammock. Um, this is basically $1,000 of chiropractor visits for 49 bucks. This will adjust you at home and get rid of the same pain of the, you're already paying thousands to go to a chiropractor and take your time to do for only 49 bucks. So you might as well try it before you really get into everything else. So those are the five mechanisms. And now we're getting into the ninja shit. This is the 80-20 of if you didn't pay attention to anything else in this whole thing, if you just want to figure out how can I really get down and motivate people to make it a impulsion to go out and buy, you know, just like to get the ferocity of Chris Farley in there, um, is how can you address the level three objections, insecurities, and whys of the audience? And this goes back to your branding, your positioning, your strategy, and everything else to figure out, yes, there's this top-level thing that you can sell, but what is that actually doing? What are people actually buying these things for? When they say they want something, when they're looking to buy something, what is that actually answering to? So for the nursing education company, 
They were looking for, hey, I need, I'm not very good at pharmacology. I want a study guide. Well, why do they want a study guide? And again, you can ask the question you get down. Usually it takes about three or four whys to get there. Why do you want a study guide? Well, I want to know I'm going to pass the test for sure. Well, why do you want to pass the test? Well, I just invested four years in nursing school. I don't want to let my family down and be embarrassed. So the more you know that like underlying anxiety, that like gut churning acid building thing that keeps them up at night, then on the top, it's you have something you can really message to that's like, hey, best pharmacology study guide. It's 100 pages. Well, guess what? Ours is now 200 pages. Does that actually help solve that deep internal core issue or not? Or can it be 20 pages? We want to solve those level three without wise insecurities before we ever solve the level one ones. Same for the baseball hitting instructions. I want, I want drills to help my, teach my kid to hit better. Well, why do you want that? I want to see them do well and enjoy the game. You know, have fun out there. It's great. Well, why? The thing they probably won't say, but the really is, is internal is I want to feel good about myself as a parent or a coach. I want to know that I did well. I want to see my kid's success is a direct reflection of my parenting. And most parents will tell you that whether they realize it or not. They want their kids to do well because it looks good for them. I'm so happy that my son is super smart and advanced for his age. Like, why does that, it doesn't make a lick of difference for me besides him may, may be able to wipe my diaper um, when I'm older. But what it really does is reflect back on I'm, I'm valuable as a parent. I'm valuable as a father because he is doing well. And same for someone, somebody who wants to buy organic baby food. I didn't buy organic before we had kids. And guess what? Now we buy the more expensive hippie baby stuff because I want healthy food for my kids. Why do you want that? Why do you care? Same food for the most part. Well, I want my kids to be healthy and smart and successful because, again, I want my kids' success to reflect on my parenting and my love for them. Or what's your deep anxieties? When you go to like luxury products, for example, what does that say about your insecurities of, I, well, I grew up poor. I want this really, I want a Rolex. I want a Lambo. I want everything else because I want people to, be, to view me as successful. The car is still going to get you from A to B, and you still need to obey the speed limits. And most of the time, the Toyota Camry is going to be a much better option than that Lambo for you. But I want to be viewed as successful because I want to validate and show to people that they were wrong about me. I made it. I'm worthwhile. I'm valuable, and I'm worthy to be loved. So the more you can make your products, whatever service, whatever thing you're selling, your offer, answer those level three insecurities, or even keep them in mind when you're writing things to understand what's really going on in the subconscious of people when they're reading that. And the more you can echo, you're going to be a great parent and your kids are going to do great. And it's going to look great and feel great to you. Buy my product. doesn't matter what that product is at that point. It could be education, could be food, could be anything else. You're solving that deep core level three insecurity and desire. So, we took you, this whole thing to wrap it up, we took you from basically, hey, there's shark infested waters, you know where people are starting out, you wanna get them to where they wanna go, which is kind of fuzzy, most people don't say no, so you need to either make the path smoother and easier to get there, make it obviously safer for them to go through to make the destination certain that they know for sure what thing they're going to and the reason to walk over these infested waters. You want to make sure the destination is more reachable for people. So how can you make those baby steps along the way to work people up and build this relationship over time? Then how can you make that destination more attractive? How can you say, Hey, that's a great, I, I you know, I, I really want to go there. And last one is how can you make this mean something for somebody? means something more and something deeper. So use this framework and this toolbox when you go out and you're trying to think of, hey, we have this product we can sell, or we have a business and we have a demographic we can cater to, what are the big things that we can offer them? Well, here's, here's something, you're just gonna hawk products up there. How can you make those products, how can you make those services, whatever it is, and all the way back to the core of your business? How can you make that something where it's now, it's easier to get there, it's safer to get there and the getting there for them is much more impactful, more meaningful, more attractive. So thank you very much for you guys' time. Um, you can reach out. I don't necessarily know. I don't have an offer. I don't have a course I'm trying to sell or Hawk and Guru stuff because we're running, we're running our own stuff. But um, reach out on social media. Um, I'm only on really Facebook or, or email. You can get a hold of me. But thank you very much for your time and uh, go out and make an offer they can't refuse. <laughs>